Palo Alto Next Generation Firewall. Let's begin. So one of the key claims to fame for Palo Alto Next Generation Firewalls is this SP3 architecture. Okay, so uh, it's a single pass processing of traffic. And there's two parts to that. And there's several sub parts to it, of course. Uh, basically, one consists of single pass software. What are we talking about there? Well, as traffic comes in our devices, let me grab my, my pen here real quick. As traffic comes in our devices, um, as we mentioned earlier, nowadays, you got to think of the hardware and software, right? And so uh, back in the day, we had firewalls and then we had separate boxes for IPS and then we had separate boxes for content filters and we had separate boxes for so-and-so. And, and that meant that all this traffic had to be processed by the firewall, by the content filter, by the IPS and so on, okay? So the, the claim to fame with, with Paolo is they built this architecture that with a single pass of the packet, uh, they could check for all of these security features without having to forward upstream to be processed or download files and you know, you know in their entirety to understand the file type meets the policy rules or not. So there's there's a single pass processing, which makes these boxes more efficient and hopefully reduces latency. It definitely does compare to the days of having separate appliances. A lot of vendors have started uh, doing similar approaches in, in their environments, but not exactly. This was built from the ground up to do these things. So uh, again, the first part, single pass software. So uh, I'm coming in with that packet and I am going to process through the device and there is then parallel processing of that packet. So um, looking, doing all my network processing, flow control, Mac, uh, QoS, route lookups, all that kind of fun stuff, NAT. Uh, but then the security processing does several important things there. We've got a function called app ID, user ID. There's a URL match, there's policy match, SSL inspection and decompression. So uh, if we need to de-encrypt traffic to look at it, all that kind of fun stuff. And, and we're gonna dive into deep of, of each of these. But basically, um, you, you know, being able to parallel, being able to look at these things in parallel, right? And then look uh, finally for signature matching, right? So, uh, is there any known signatures that would detect a threat with these? Okay, so uh, and, and we're looking for that. Now, part of this also is, uh, you know, parallel processing and hardware. There's these separate buckets, right? Is where it kind of kind of looks at. Now, there's two parts to that. Uh, one is is that they've built a completely separate control and data plane. So all devices have a control plane, they've got a data plane. But this has their own resources allocated to each. So if you're an administrator, for example, and you're running a report, um, and that starts eating up from the control plane, it's not going to affect the packet processing side or the data plane from throughput. So uh, even though you might have high resource utilization on one side, it's not going to affect the other. Traversely, if you've got a lot of traffic, maybe you're oversubscribed to your firewall, you got too many services running, too much decryption, whatever it is, and you need to access the management plane of the device, you're not going to be stuck not being able to manage it until you kill all the sessions, as with some other firewalls out there uh, that, that basically don't have these separated, right? Uh, so thanks to that, uh, we, we always will be able to either access the management and the data will forward, or we could you know, be running high, highly... Um, burdensome administrative task, for example, but that not affect the forwarding and the processing of those packets. So there's a lot with this SP3 architecture we're going to talk about. To really understand this, though, we need to learn more about these services. Okay, so what is app ID? What is user ID? What do those do for us? Okay, and we're going to look at that next. But just remember, it's about the single stream of data processing. Okay, without having to forward to a bunch of different devices uh, to, to get the amount of security that you're getting out of our next generation firewalls, okay? And that's, again, part of why we call them next generation because back in the day, <laughs> these were all separate devices and a lot of times separate hardware even that uh, we, uh, we we had to forward to to do each thing, even from just firewall rules, um, okay, in your policy uh, to doing IPS. Nowadays, there's pretty much not a firewall sold that doesn't have some type of IPS integrated into it uh, one way or another. There was some vendors for a while that were trying to just um, say, look, this one box does all this, but really what they did was they added a different module with its own processor memory, okay, and hard drive or a little flash card, 
inside that box, but it had a separate interface on there and it had to be forwarded upstream. So even though it was one box, it was technically two applications still running in the box. Um, so they were kind of getting away with that one box for all this stuff uh, for a while. But nowadays, like I said, it's, it's very much uh, combining uh, multi-service, uh, multi-security services inside of our firewalls. Again, it's not an end-all be-all security uh, appliance, but all of the traditional security features you would want to be inspecting and looking at our traffic are definitely here in our next generation firewalls. Um, so it, a lot of it has to do with where they're deployed, how they're configured and all that kind of fun stuff. So first of all, we've got network interfaces. We mentioned this before, but along with the different port types and media options of our interfaces, uh, we've got that important concept of zones that we will talk about. And of course, if we look at our security zones over here, you can see already we've got one that's untrust and one that's trust. And this was just some temporary settings I did on our uh, lab Palo that we're gonna be working a lot with. To define an inside interface, for example, you can see this guy's green, he's lit up. Uh, so the port's uh, enabled and it's active. And you can see that is a trust zone, for example. And this is our untrust zone. So these are the building blocks of creating a policy. So now I can go in and create a policy uh, that says, hey, to allow traffic from you know, the trusted network to the untrusted network, but don't allow traffic from the untrusted network to the trusted network unless it was sourced from the trusted network, right? And that's our basic inspection, for example. But we can get much deeper uh, as we're talking about. I think it's just important that everybody remember, in, you know, nowadays, the big problem I see with a lot of people learning this stuff is because there's so many services that are packed into one device it's overwhelming to people, right? And you're not separating what each of these things do and really understand what's going on. We've got to kind of look at each thing individually, which is what we're going to try to do in this class, right? So um, interfaces, yes, but we can also do VLANs, for example, which are virtual interfaces. So virtual interfaces, I may have eight uh, physical gig ports, but I've got pretty much unlimited amount of virtual interfaces that I could use on these ports. Now, virtual interfaces can be configured in a, a couple different ways. One is, is we could do sub interfaces uh, on our uh, interface, or we could just create a VLAN, for example, an SVI, uh, which is a switched virtual interface that operates in that VLAN, and then that have, um, you know, uh, the same thing that could be assigned to security zones and all that kind of stuff and be used to create policies. So there's a lot of capabilities to expand and create interfaces, however we need loopbacks, for example, um, there's tunneled interfaces and then SD-WAN, virtual wires, for example. So there's all different ways to um, combine these interfaces. Again, sometimes we don't just want one physical interface to go to our LAN, for example, right? So right now, <clears throat> we've got one layer three interface that is a LAN interface. It's got a LAN address that's kind of used as our default gateway temporarily, but what happens if that interface or that cable is bad? right? Or the connector goes bad or any, any of those kind of things. So uh, we probably want to set up some link aggregation, right? And create virtual wire to do that, where we use more than one uh, physical interface, bond them together, where I get not only uh, redundancy there, but I get uh, additional performance. So instead of one gig uh, connectivity to that interface, I could have two gigs of connectivity to that interface um, if we set it up right. So there's a lot of things that we can do like that. Plus, uh, a lot of companies have more than one ISP, especially at their headquarters or, or any type of large branch offices. And that's where we get into like SD-WANs, for example. So even here, we've got a couple different ISPs, even in my home lab um, as an instructor. It's critical that I always have internet access. So I want to make sure that if anything ever happens to my primary ISP, I can go straight to the secondary and get internet access. So uh, lots of flexibility whenever it comes to interfaces, and we're going to look more at these in the labs whenever we configure them. But these are some of the interface types uh, to use that are the building blocks of our policies. Okay. Now virtual routers. Virtual routers, in order to forward route and route packets, right, to, to do lookups and figure out, look at a routing table, we have to have interfaces that can participate in those virtual routers. So uh, these interfaces are also the building blocks for our virtual routers, for example, okay? And we talked about zones. Zones are a, a critical part because 
just because I have an interface, and that interface could be layer two, could be layer three, could be, like we said, virtual wire, number of things. Um, it, it, we still have to know where it, it, it's supposed to do its job, right? Um, and then what traffic is coming from that interface that we to terminate, you know, to, to the rest of the networks out there. So um, even the smaller PA220, for example, we've got gig ports that we can use to either do segmentation through VLANs and trunking, for example, um, and create a bunch of logical different networks to segment traffic. We could do it that way. Um, there's a lot of reasons to segment traffic other than just in and inside. Okay, so um, segmentation is a critical network security, um, you know, uh, component, and that's something that every network should have segmentation through. And there's a lot of different ways to do it. Um, so. Our firewalls could be a gateway. We may have a router inside or a layer three switch that's terminating all these different networks. And then the gateway of last resort is our firewall to get up to the internet. Or we might have different ports connected to our, uh, you know, our layer three switch or our router that uh, breaking off each port. Maybe I've got a designated guest interface or a designated contractor interface, right? So there's many, many different ways we can configure these things. And so just because I connect a port doesn't mean I know where, what it is or what it's doing, right? So I, I need a way to tell the firewall that this port is doing this, and this port has this level of trust. So in order to do that, uh, we use zones for that. I think I've already mentioned this before. So in this example, uh, you know, at a minimum on our edge firewalls, we typically have an internet edge zone. We may have a WAN zone that comes up here and connects our WAN, WAN being wide area network that connects remote branches. Now these are typically the least lines that connect from one location to the other that give us dedicated um, connectivity between our offices. But nowadays we're, we're doing a lot of SD-WAN for example. So we're using the public internet and creating virtual tunnels for VPN uh, to connect our remote sites as well. It's a lot cheaper, doesn't necessarily give you the guarantee of the bandwidth. So uh, some people, for example, have dedicated lines for VoIP uh, service. So I can I can make VoIP calls between offices with good call quality. But then for other applications that are not as time sensitive, uh, we could use the, you know, the public internet connections, which usually are a lot faster, ironically, but they just don't have the guarantee of latency or time, right? So uh, I might have a different interface and say, hey, that's my WAN zone. This is my internet edge zone. And then here's a DMZ. Now a DMZ is another uh, critical part to understand. It's called a demilitarized zone. It is typically uh, an area of trust, but the DMZ is where I'm gonna have um, public facing service services, such as like, I, I may have my web server in here, or I may have a few web servers in here may have a rack of web servers. It depends on the size of the organization, right? But then I'm probably going to have like email server. Okay. I might have a SharePoint. Okay. Uh, anything that I need to access publicly, I might have, um, it, it, you know, public facing or, or websites that I only want employees to get to. There's a lot of different things. So it, here's the thing. These servers I manage and they are managed, but they're not necessarily, I don't want them listed as a data center application. That is, you know, where my critical applications are. These uh, servers will have ports and services open to each of these. So like, for example, uh, WWW may have ports 443 and 80 open to them, right? Email may have 25 or SMP or POP or IMAP or whatever uh, open to those but you typically are going to allow whatever the application needs to be public facing. And then we're also going to do some NAT uh, so I can use a public address. Let's say we use like 1.1.1.1 and say I own that, right? Um, we don't own that, but just say I did. Well, um, I could make sure that the firewall, any request for 1.1.1.1 was then terminated to uh, whatever network space I've got in here and to hit our primary web server or our web proxy that advertises our corporate website, right? So uh, there's a lot of different ways to configure that, but just know that the demilitarized zone, it's not trusted. So this is where not only zones come in handy, but trust comes in handy. So uh, a lot of times we'll use scoring. So we'll say, for example, Internet Edge, we have a trust level of zero out here, okay? 
Whenever it comes to the DMZ, you could think of that as a trust level of maybe 50. So yeah, it's my servers, I manage them, but there's services on those servers that are public facing, meaning people are coming from the internet to reach these servers. Therefore, there's higher risk of things uh, you know, happening with those servers, a web server may be compromised or an application server may be compromised um, that gives them access to that server to where they could be damaged if they just had the same level of access to the rest of our network. So, and then of course, we've got our uh, data center layer over here, and these may be separate interfaces, again, or they may just be logical constructs in the firewall. Doesn't matter. The point is, is I'm defining these different zones, okay, so that I can create policies between them. So that I can say Internet Edge can access these ports on these boxes um, from the public internet, and they can come inside the firewall to do that. Remember I said that stateful inspection traffic, by default, we don't want anybody coming in uh, of a untrusted zone unless there was a session that went out and requested that session to come in, right? That's that state flow inspection on traffic. Of course, we're doing a lot more uh, analysis on that traffic than just that, but that's that fundamental concept to keep in mind with these zones. And of course, the campus uh, land, I may have several different lands that we're terminating off this guy, and those will probably have uh, you know, implicit trust because they're the campus. And these are all, these numbers here, they're, they're just a representation of a level of trust, for example, so zero being the least and 100 being the most. Um, but you've got flexibility in your policy to change that level of trust. And it's really done with our security policies, right? So uh, more than just a score. But that's just a way you can kind of understand there is different levels uh, of trust and different levels of policies that I would create between these zones. Um, but before I can create those policies, I have to be able to understand that the campus is the campus, the data center is the data center, DMZ is DMZ, Internet Edge is what it is, and WAN is what it is, and any other zones you might have, right? So for, for anything else, contractors, guests, all that kind of fun stuff, or IoT may have zones for that stuff. So uh, it just depends. All right. So as we start building out uh, our firewall policies, we use objects uh, to do that. So, and there's a lot of different types of objects nowadays. Um, one is regional, right? So where are you located around the world? But that's uh, not quite as common as some of the others. You know, it is a big deal. Should, if we're a US-based company, should we ever have sessions going to China, for example, um, for certain applications, maybe web traffic, if that. Um, but, and, and a lot of devices are made in China, so you might have some policies that China is an iffy subject, don't get too much into it at the moment, but later on we'll do it. But regions would give us that ability. But we've got to address groups, for example. So a single address is not going to be technically, typically one object. But let's say that we've got uh, web servers at dot five, dot six, and dot seven, right? Whatever the, the first three octets don't matter but we've got web servers and, and with these hosts. So we could define these addresses in the system, .5.6.7, okay? And then we put them in a group because they're of similar nature. And we could say, these are our web servers, for example. So any web servers that we would uh, have, for example, could go in the web servers group. And then I would have rules that say, hey, for these uh, web servers, we're allowing people to access them on AD and 443, which are the traditional web, pro, uh, web ports. You might have some other need than that, maybe 8080 or some you know other port, but that's just an example of kind of some default uh, ways to address things in groups. What about internal networks? I might have you know employee networks in several different VLANs across an enterprise, or we might have just designed it so that you know hey all 10 networks that are 10 to 1 and these last two octets. Anything there? I, I know that that would be employees, so you know I can create a group for that, right? Or I can say, hey, anything in the 10 one uh, through 10 two, or anything in the 10 one through whatever the number is, right? 10 100. These are all going to be employee networks, for example. It all depends on how you designed your network in the first place. Okay. So once you have similar uh, device types or similar groups. Uh, of objects, I can group them together in a group, and that simplifies our policy, okay? 
um, just like services and service groups. So for example, we may say uh, Port 80 and 443 are web services, for example. Or, you know, we've got uh, ports 21 for FTP, right? Or we need SSH ports port 22. So it, it all comes with understanding what applications may be used where, and then creating those groups. So I could say, hey, these are allowed here. These are allowed with this group. These are allowed with this group. All that kind of fun stuff, okay? And then you can even go further and say uh, application groups, right? So through that deep packet inspection, we can identify uh, applications. So maybe for employees, uh, we want to make sure that they've got access to all the employee applications that are used. And you can even define custom applications as well um, that you may have built. Okay. And you define the ports that are needed on it or whatever resources are needed for it. But um, then with those application groups, maybe we want to block uh, BitTorrent. Maybe we want to block uh, Tor networking and BitTorrent. And we can also jump into uh, categorization, for example. So uh, maybe uh, any uh, you know adult sites we want to block, or we might want to limit you know any type of uh, Facebook or social media during business hours, uh, or especially for certain user groups. Okay, you have that capability uh, by defining the, the individual types, and then we create objects and groups. And those groups allow us to customize the policies. Okay. Even down here, whenever we get into custom objects, data patterns, spyware, if we're licensed for these features, that is, um, and looking for antivirus, any spyware, and known threats. And of course, uh, we're connecting, if we use those packages back to Palo Alto's data centers, where they look for known threats, and they can update our list dynamically, which is very cool. Okay. We'll talk more about that as we get closer to those areas. <clears throat> okay, so we've talked a little bit about that session processing. Uh, let's start talking a little bit more about this app ID, this user ID, that security processing, right? That happens parallel. See what all this is about, okay? So app ID, first of all, traffic comes in, and a lot of applications nowadays are using some type of encryption, okay? A lot of websites, for example, are using some type of encryption. So somebody might be doing benign things and going out to Wi-Fi training.com. Wi-Fi training.com, I would see that somebody went out to Wi-Fi training.com if I was using DNS filtering, for example. But I wouldn't be able to send, see what data they were sending to Wi-Fi training.com or what type of files they may be uploading to Wi-Fi training.com if I didn't have some visibility into that data. So uh, Palos offer the ability to do decryption. It's a, it's a big key feature of the Palos where um, basically we can decrypt the SS, uh, as any SSL traffic and a few other types of applications as well. Uh, so bottom line is we're looking for, is there an app signature that matches this type of application? Um, is, the I, is it ID by known protocol decoder? Okay, so there's all these packet decoder, packet processors that look for different signatures that define an application. There's 4,000 different applications that we can identify on our palos nowadays. Okay, and then if we can't um, identify it by these, we'll do we'll use heuristics, right? So behavior. So how is this application behaving? It's not no longer, guys. Here's the thing: um, we used to be able to control things and say, look, we're going to allow DNS to anybody. We're going to allow web anybody, all that kind of stuff. But it is script kitty uh, level knowledge that I could go and, you know, let me check to see if 53, they've got all the security here, but let me see if I can tunnel, maybe create a VPN tunnel to uh, some command and control server. And I'm going to use port 53 to do it. A lot of people just leave 53 open because it's required for DNS, for example. But then I was able to use 53 to connect to my VPN proxy or my command and control server. And I've got full access to the internet. And then I can send whatever data I want. I can bypass all their security. I can do a lot of nefarious things. So it's no longer about just the ports, right? Or the application, whenever people really conformed to application requirements. Nowadays in security, we're even doing obfuscation. So we might have web servers that are for administrators to use, and they're not even running on 80 or 443. There's a special port we want to sign so that it just, it's obfuscates, right? 
um, it, it makes it a little bit harder to identify that there's something interesting going on there. Well, uh, heuristics and behavior analytics uh, help us to identify, it doesn't matter the port, doesn't matter the named application, but how's it behaving? Is this behaving like it's supposed to? And based on that, we can, you know, applications that are doing normal things should behave the way they're supposed to. If there's something not behaving right, that could be a problem that could be uh, something we want to stop, right? So, uh, and then we take action about that, right? So, uh, regardless. Now, it is an option to do decryption. Many, 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 many people do this at the enterprise level. You're still going to have end-to-end encryption. What we are doing basically is just man in the middle in our own traffic, okay? It is a prerequisite for a lot of different security, in fact. So what that means is, is we've got an, as a server certificate on this side, on the firewall on the inside, that is trusted by employees and all the people that we are decrypting, okay? Uh, whenever they open up a session to say wi fi frame.com, they hit that internal certificate first, and they start an encrypted session between the firewall and themselves. The firewall goes out on the outside and starts an encrypted session uh, with wi fi train.com and then it connects the two. Okay. In the middle, though, it is clear text. So I've got a man in the middle of my own network. That's basically what we're doing with all the decryption. Okay. But that allows us to get a much better uh, visibility into the applications, into the traffic flow. And if we're trying to do things like data loss prevention or PCI compliance with uh, HIPAA compliance, things like that, when we're trying to analyze for certain keywords or documents or uh, phrases or credit card numbers, we need visibility in the data to do that. So that's a big part of getting full application information. Because if I can tunnel, I can put whatever I want through the tunnel and chances are you may not be able to understand it unless I can get in mind somehow, okay? All right, so content ID is another one of those. Uh, we've got user ID, app ID, content ID. Um, content ID is about looking at the data itself. So data filtering, and as I mentioned, credit card numbers, um, you know, medical records, buzzwords, keywords that we're looking for to make sure that people aren't exfilling important data or um, that, that somebody's not grabbing and exporting data, whether the employee knows about it or not. Remember, if an employee's machine is compromised, we believe that machine is the employee but it could be somebody else from, you know, not from the company who's hacked that machine, who is doing things on behalf of that employee that they're not even aware of. So uh, obviously that's a big, big problem. We don't want to have that. Uh, that also has to do with making sure you've got very good host security, that Windows is patched, all that kind of fun stuff. But bottom line is, is we still need to act as if that could happen and be able to analyze the data. So there's real-time threat prevention, looking for uh, threat outbreaks of worms, viruses, malware, all that kind of stuff. Uh, data filtering, look for different types of data, uh, and also the, the the content itself. So should we allow executables, right? Or should we allow scripts? Or should we allow uh, things we know to be, um, you know, things impersonating PDFs, for example, or uh, any of that type of stuff? So there's numerous threats, and we'll go over some of those threats in a special section, just kind of talking about security and, and threats. Uh, but that is what the content ID processing helps us with. Okay, so we're looking for payload threats, maybe threats in DNS. You know, we could use DNS to tunnel things in a lot of different ways. E even over, uh, you know, DNS ending, I could send, you know, data out to servers uh, that you may not realize uh, through, st through strings of DNS queries, for example. Um, so there's a bunch of different things uh, to manipulate that people are looking for, but using content ID, we're able to uh, identify those threats and get rid of those. So. Now, user ID, um, we've got user and role-based access. So here's the other thing. Uh, we want to know that our devices are what they say they are, right? So if somebody says, hey, I'm on an employee workstation, that's easy. That's going to be connected to typically Active Directory, or if it's Mac, it's probably going to be registered with a uh, MDM, mobile device management tool, that we could um, verify that that device is what it's supposed to be. But whenever you talk about things like facilities devices, right, like UPS is like bad readers, like uh, access control systems, um, all those Internet of Things devices, all those devices that live out there nowadays, environmental controls, right, lighting controls, um, building automation tools, okay. Um, we want to make sure the device is what it's supposed to be, but we also want to make sure that users on our devices are who we believe them to be. 
So this makes it very easy to create application policies, for example, to say, hey, you know what? It may not allow employees and contractors to access social sites and, you know, uh, gambling sites and sports sites and all the, you know, personal fun stuff out there, but maybe executives are allowed more leeway in those applications. So the only way we could actually build rules like that is if we knew that an executive was who they say they are and they belong to a group that, you know, says executive, for example, or says administration or whatever that group is. We have to have some type of unique way to identify the person. Um, and then we can build policies around uh, who they are, the devices they're on. Maybe I don't want you to get the same permissions on your iPhone that you get on your corporate workstation. Or maybe I don't care as much on an iPhone, but I do care uh, on, on your workstation. So there's a lot of different ways to see this cat. This is just a tool in the tool belt, okay? Um, also, maybe for certain sites or maybe for access to really secret stuff or really uh, protected stuff like um, you know financial applications or um, medical records, things like that. Maybe we want to implement multi-factor application, uh, multi-factor authentication. Sorry about that, MFA. So, um, and then we may also want to make sure that no other, you know, uh, web proxies or uh, cross-site scripting or things like that can fish for credentials. Okay, so we want to, you know, uh, keep an eye out for that. So there's a lot of things we do with user ID, and again, it's part of that parallel processing. So this is an example in policy of what this looks like. So we could create, for example, uh, so this is just local groups at the moment, but we could, you know, create these groups with, um, you know, against any type of directory server, LDAP, uh, Radius, all that kind of good stuff, um, uh, AD uh, connectors to make sure that the users and or groups are who they say they are. We can also get uh, machine information out of AD if it's Windows based machines as well. So in this example, you got tolerated uh, SaaS applications. So these are acceptable. This is for acting all employees. And you can see that, hey, you know what, Gmail, uh, downloading stuff from G uh, Gmail, Google, uh, LinkedIn, and Twitter, those are uh, available, right? But we're also applying uh, a lot of security policies around it, right? We're making sure that antivirus and you know, uh, malware, and we're inspecting the traffic, that we're looking for threats, and that we're looking for any type of data expel as well. So, and then you've got this um, allowed rule here. It says, hey, these are sanctioned, you know, SAS, and this is for finance department. So based on the user uh, group, you know, and then we could also say, hey, and they need to be on their corporate machines, right? So if they belong to this group and they're on corporate machines, then they can go between these zones for these applications, right? And then, you know, you could choose allow, deny, or inspect, whatever it is but it gives us context to allow user groups for policy decision-making. That's why it's important. And this lesson's kind of run long. Uh, device ID, same thing. So not just so much about the uh, user information, but the devices themselves. So in this example, we're uh, looking at uh, Aruba APs, for example, or Raspberry Pis uh, to create rules around them. And we're allowing the applications that those devices need specifically without allowing things that don't, kind of that zero trust uh, philosophy. So, and then we've got rules of applications based on that. And then the security profiles, web filtering, uh, all that kind of stuff, URL filtering, DNS, name it. So threat protection. All right. So uh, this is what the look like in the policies. Looks like I didn't get to update some of the images, but that's okay. Um, and then in the logs, Guys, here's the thing. Not only are we creating these policies, but we can log uh, the details from these policies, right? So, um, and, and see what's going on with that, um, you know, based on device, for example, okay? So uh, that's, a, that's another good thing. So if we're analyzing traffic and we wanna see, hey, what's really happening, we can take a look, do that. So you can see source uh, equipment and destination equipment. And again, we've got equipment groups so we could say, hey, this is network security equipment, or this is, you know, this is this, uh, you know, Palo device, and it's going to Polycom phone or Apple to Macintosh, Mac OS, all that kind of stuff. Okay, so, all right. So again, virtual routers. Um, virtual routers allow connectivity, and if you're from the Cisco world, you're looking at like VRFs, right? The routing instance has its own routing table. Okay, 
So basically it allows you to interconnect between virtual routers or between different interfaces for traffic to get through the firewall. Now I say through, but I mean processed by the firewall. So it's not just gonna go through the firewall, it's gonna hit whatever rules are tied to that, uh, those interfaces, and then do processing accordingly, okay? All right, and then policies, we're gonna build a lot of these out in the lab. Uh, this is on our 220. You can see we've got uh, just a couple rules here, really, and this is a very default policy table, okay? Uh, this was basically just to get us out to the internet. So you can see that uh, rule one, we're saying trust uh, zone source to destination untrust, and we're allowing anything. So very wide open at the moment, not doing anything crazy. We're going to be building that out in, in future labs. Um, and then the application signatures, uh, we've talked about these, but the modern update 10.2, I think we're on, uh, over 4,000 different applications are identified. And then we can create application groups to give people access or um, different uh, user groups or interface groups or zones access to different applications uh, if we need to, okay? So all of that goes back into, sure I've got this picture again, hang on. So all of that, you know, putting this back into context, all those session processing, right? Single packet processing, parallel hardware processing. Got a different control plane, different data plane, okay? So I, I can have uh, the control plane could be burned, could be um, highly subscribed, slow, all that kind of stuff, the data plane be fine. Traversely, it could be the opposite. I could be able to manage the box and look at reporting all day long, but data plane is, is struggling with whatever reason. Um, it could be wrong policies, it could be, uh, you know, accidentally double decrypting things, uh, or it could be just too widespread decryption. It could be a number of things. It could be undersizing these appliances. So we're gonna talk about that uh, coming up as well. Uh, that's some of the issues I've seen with all firewalls is just not being sized properly. Everybody looks at you know, the, the, the basic capabilities of our devices and looks at how many flows and sessions and, and port speeds, but they don't really think about once I add all these advanced services and plugins and I'm doing all this different inspection, and then I throw decryption on there. That, even just adding inspection, uh, adds overhead to the box. And that's one of the basic firewall feature sets. But once we start doing decryption, and once we start uh, you know, doing advanced processing, so we're talking about this guy here, right? For uh, app ID, user ID, all those cool things we just talked about, uh, especially decryption. And then we do signature matching, um, and, and really in-depth rules, we're gonna be taxing the box pretty hard. Okay, so sizing these is a very important thing. Again, we're gonna talk about it. This ended up being a lot longer lesson than I was thinking it would, but that's good. Hope you enjoyed it. We'll see you in the next one.